This is the Danger Close Podcast, Beyond the Books, with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. This is another special episode of Danger Close, doing a recap of the previous novels in the lead up to publication of Only the Dead, the sixth novel in the James Reese Terminal List series. And in this one, we are going to talk about In the Blood. And here with me today is my friend, David Brown, publicist extraordinaire from Simon & Schuster, Atria, Emily Bessler Books. And we're going to go through in the blood. Now I did set I up in the blood a little bit at the end of the last novel. Um, so it gave me a direction. Yeah, this is like uh, the beginning of a TV show when you hear the voiceover guy they, previously <laughs> in the James <laughs> Reese saga. Exactly. And then they show scenes from past episodes. So. I know we should do that. That would be really cool to do that. Take well, that's the, what uh, we're doing. We're, we we're take describing the, scenes from the past episodes. I know we could take scenes. the, uh, the ironclad video trailers and do that and do like a, uh, you know, people would be very confused. They think, wait a second, did I miss a series? You know, that would, be, <laughs> that would be really cool. Cause we, in each of these trailers, um, you know, they're not just, uh, going out there and getting some stock footage here and throwing it together and putting up some graphics and, you know, writing gripping or whatever, you know, Ba-da-dum. Um, they are serious productions and no, they are, they are amazing. And this one really sticks in my brain because it, it animates or puts into real, uh, uh action, the fight scene in the meat locker that is described in this book, which yep. is a, a pivotal scene. It's also an iconic scene in the series, but I, but it plays out in, in, uh, in the, in the, in the trailer that Ironclad made. And it's, yep. I, Anytime you have meat as a weapon, I'm all in. <laughs> it's, uh, they did such a good job with all of these. So many people get confused and uh, ask me, is Chris Pratt in this? There's always in the comments uh, when I post these uh, on uh, the social channels every single time. Even if I say in the copy, first sentence in there is, uh, you know, enjoy this uh, video trailer for Only the Dead or In the Blood or True Believer or whatever it is. Still, first question, uh, is Chris Pratt in this? Is this, when is this coming out? It's, uh, well, the book is coming out soon, uh, but they think that it's, uh, it's something from Amazon Prime. So it's not yet, not yet. This is my buddy Dom Rosso, who uh, plays James Reese in these, picks up the tomahawk, crushes it, and it's ironclad out there getting, I mean, there are sets and there are cameras everywhere and it is so professional. Uh, the weapons from the book, a uh, scenes from the book that I like to not be exact so that when someone gets to that scene, there it's not blown for them already. But the spirit of the scene is there like in the meat locker or whatever it might it might be. So I like to have the spirit of those scenes, not exactly what happens if that uh, if that makes sense. And uh, this one right here, um, ah, sniper centric novel of uh, of violent resolutions. That was the guiding principle behind this one. And I set it up in the last book. Um, I wanted there to be enough resolution in the last book where that particular storyline um, saw its end, but there were certain things that propelled the overall story forward. Um, and so that is with uh, an assassin having James Reese's number and needing to find him, draw him out and, uh, and take him off the board. And he does that by killing someone who James Reese uh, knew back in Iraq uh, when he was working for the CIA, which was something that uh, that I did for a little bit in Iraq in 2006. So a lot of these, that part of this novel and my latest novel and other things that I'm, I'm working on um, has a touch point because that was such a such an impactful time uh, in the war and for for me as an operator attached to us, uh, this covert action unit. So um, so there's a bar that I mentioned in here that uh, that that may have uh, may bear a striking resemblance to an actual bar in the green zone back in the day. Um, so anyway, there's a lot, a lot of personal things are in all of these novels. Mostly it's the feelings and emotions behind certain events that I was involved with. But in cases like this, it's also a time and a place and a feeling from that time and a place. And uh, so that was, uh, that makes these even more fun, more therapeutic in many cases and more impactful, more powerful, I think, um, uh, as, as an author, as a writer, as I'm sitting down to, to do this. But uh, in the blood, sniper centric novel of violent Faso, resolutions. Right? We, we sure do. And this is uh, Reese's uh, friend from Iraq getting blown out of the sky by Nazar. And uh, so I go through go through all that, and uh, bam, 
Now we go back. James Reese is in Montana, and uh, he's with the Katie and with Rafe Hastings. And this come this news comes over the television, and it starts talking about the terrorist attack, and then it starts putting up the pictures of the victims. And one of those pictures is of this person that James Reese knew back in Iraq, but it puts her up there under a different name and. A, a photo that looks like it's from a bio from a company website, something like that. And, uh, and so he stops, he freezes, he knows exactly who that is and tells Katie, I got to go back to Langley. And so that kicks off this, this journey of, uh, going back to Langley, getting a little bit of a briefing from Vic Rodriguez there, who also lets him know that the president wants to see him, who is a key figure in the last novel. And, uh, the president wants him to to go to a certain place in Texas, in uh, in San Antonio. And he thinks it'll help Reese going forward in his mission because Reese did something for the president in the last book that was personal. And uh, so the president wants to repay that favor. And Reese goes to, uh, to this facility underground in San Antonio and discovers, is introduced to someone named Alice, a quantum computer, uh, artificial intelligence. And this is where I went deep down the rabbit hole into the capabilities of artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Uh, once again, similar to the way I did in the previous novel where I went down the rabbit hole into bioweapons research. This time I went into quantum computing and artificial intelligence. And what is our intelligence community doing with this technology? How advanced is it? Uh, and I would be shocked if the facility that I describe in the novel isn't almost exactly that way in real life. And once again, I had no touch points with the military as far as our artificial intelligence or quantum computing. This is all done uh, after my time in the military as uh, essentially doing what an investigative reporter would do to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So um, Reese meets Alice and uh, she helps him along the way in this novel. And first off, he goes to the site of the terrorist event in Burkina Faso and walks the ground where the plane went down and um, then finds out that Nazar has been captured by a CIA paramilitary group. And uh, Reese is going to meet this person who killed Freddie Strain and who killed Aaliyah, his friend from Iraq. And uh, but this causes a problem because Reese's plan the whole time is to put that person down, to put Nazar down. And they uh, board a helicopter and the Nazar is surrounded by essentially armed guards, essentially, even though he's a, he's a prisoner. And Ox is there, another CIA paramilitary operator. And uh, he knows Reese wants to kill this, uh, this person, but they have to go question him somewhere. And a uh, helicopter lifts off. And then there's a pretty cool fight scene on an great airborne scene. helicopter. That Thank helicopter you. Helicopter scene is great. Thank yeah, you. Great I appreciate scene. that. And uh, not knowing too much about helicopters, I had to reach out to people. So I reached out to Don Bentley, who is uh, has the Matt Drake series and has written some of the Tom Clancy Jr. novels, and is now going to take the torch um, and start writing the Vince Flynn Mitch Rap series after Kyle Mills fill, uh, finishes up with his uh, final Vince Flynn novel this August. Is it August or September when it comes out? September. September. So. This yeah. September. And uh, so I asked Don, because Don was an Apache helicopter pilot. So I'm like, hey, what does it feel like to auto rotate to Earth? And I wanted to make sure that if a helicopter pilot read this part, they'd think, ah, at least this Jack Carr guy did his research here. He talked to someone who knew what they were talking about. So uh, not being a pilot, I reached out to Don on that one. Really appreciate him uh, spending some time with me and talking about uh, helicopters and auto rotating and all that. Um, but yeah, there's a fight scene on a helicopter that was pretty fun to write. And once again, you're aggressively and creatively solving problems. Uh, I have to figure out uh, how do you get is there to escape now? How do you uh, how do you do this? So anyway, that's part is so much fun for me. But uh, yeah, there's a there's a helicopter crash, bodies all over the place, fire, smoke, uh, maneuvering through smoke, trying to track uh, Nazar down, find out if he's alive, is he not? So uh, so that's that's the end of the part one, right around there, uh, is with Nazar's escape, and then into part two, and this is one of the ones that I really wanted to go to Israel. Uh, cause that's where Leah is from uh, dual citizen U S and Israeli. And it was so important to me to go to Israel for this one. But once again, this is COVID and Israel in particular is very difficult to get into, especially if you're not an Israeli citizen. So I had to do a ton of research on Israel without 
going there. It just didn't work out. They kept changing what you had to do to get in and get out. And it just, it just didn't work. And that was a very concerning to me. So I just doubled down on all my efforts to, uh, to research Israel and go, uh, figure this part of the book out this, this middle section of the book, part two. And I sent it to a friend in Israel. Uh, well, I sent to a friend here who then sent it to his family in Israel. Uh, Gavi, who's been on the podcast before, awesome. And uh, he sent it to his family and three generations read it and all came back and said that they couldn't believe I didn't put boots on the ground there for this section. And so that's what I was going for. I was like, oh my goodness, thank you so much. And uh, so that was really cool. I'll get over there at some point for a future novel because I just can't believe I have not been there yet. So this is a really cool section where Reese goes to the Mossad. He goes to, so Israeli intelligence. And he has some questions too about uh, Aaliyah. Was she really trying to recruit him in Iraq? What was really, what was her mission there? Uh, so there's some questions there that I like to, to play around with. Um, he meets the head of the Mossad and then goes out there to, uh, to meet, uh, Aaliyah's family at a, her, or her, uh, her children who are being cared for by her sister. Uh, and anyway, it uh, have a, there's a terrorist attack there focused on Reese. And anyway, I loved writing this Israel portion of the book. Got to weave in a Galil rifle, which is uh, something that I've wanted to do for a while. Uh, an instructor at Buds introduced me to what a Galil was back in the day, and I now have one. But uh, yeah, this was, this was a really cool section to write. Um, and then it moves on to part three. And uh, Reese continues the hunt and goes to meet the bookseller, Abelard. Now, this guy I love. Oh, I love awesome. Him. I love this guy. I love it. Now, there's a scene. Uh, there are very few. There, I can count on my hand the number of scenes that I only ever read. You know, I, there was no trailer made about it. There was no movie or TV show. I've only read, though, when I close my eyes, I see it. Nice. And the scene that starts with the... Uh, the kids playing soccer, the ball rolls into the the, the uh, bookstore and uh, that sets off a chain of events that ends into like a big battle. I, I see that scene. Aww. So it, whether it's the way you wrote it, it's the way I interpret. I see that. And it was never in front of me. So that's a, a very, very small number of scenes that I've ever read in my life that occur like that. Oh, that's so cool. That's so, and I, I loved writing this because I got to go research into how do you restore um, an, an, a book? How do you restore an old book? How do you store a book? What uh, um, what uh, can degrade a book's condition and how do you fix it? And anyway, I got to go into this, uh, the background of a bookseller who was a former uh, Israeli Mossad operative who ends up staying in Italy and uh, He's, he's wounded and he can't walk anymore. He's paralyzed. He's in a wheelchair, but uh, he's kind of a facilitator now. And uh, Reese needs to find him because he was uh, a facilitator for Nazar. And he's kind of a shadowy figure who works out of his bookstore. And I loved writing his backstory, loved researching the restoration of books, loved researching the area uh, that I that I set this in. I uh, wish I could have gone there, but uh, this one was one, another one that was all, all just research. And uh, then writing that scene and, uh, and figuring out you have a bomb in a bookstore about to go off. There's kids there that are leaving the store and this thing's about to go off. You can't throw it out the door after the kids. Uh, what do you do? And so it was fun figuring that out creatively, um, having weapons in the store, but uh, because of this guy is a facilitator, but now they're not sighted in. So in a, in a you know, most novels I think would be like, oh, you just grab a rifle. If you don't, if you're not a student of the gun, you just think you just grab one and you just go and just, it shoots. And if you have the skill, then it just works like that. Well, you gotta sight these things in. And you have no idea how they're sighted in if it's just a rifle that you pick up, especially one that's uh, that's not in an, like an active armory or one that belongs to your buddy or something like that. It's just in a safe. Um, so you don't know if they work, but guess what is there? A shotgun. And uh, so that shotgun is one that you can count on. And uh, so I got to work with, uh, with that and uh, go back in the memory banks and think about uh, the shotgun training that I've had and then put that to use in this scene, which was, uh, was super fun 
to write. So, um, so yeah, this was a good one. This was a good one. And uh, it also bonds Reese with this bookseller as part of this scene. It moves across the street into a meat locker. And uh, this part was inspired by David Morell's Fraternity of the Stone, where there is a, uh, a scene essentially in the dark. Um, and I read that back in junior high, maybe, maybe early high school. But uh, it, that scene always stood out to me. So another hat tip to, to David Morell. Um, and uh, Fraternity of the Stone is the second book in the Brotherhood of the Rose. Now they call it the Abelard uh, Sanction. And then that's why Abelard is, uh, is from David Morrell as well, from the, from the Abelard Sanction for those who are fans. Um, so yeah, the meat locker scene and then on to a little torture scene, get some info and then, uh, and then over and into the, the final, the final part, the, the sniper on sniper section of the novel that I wanted this to, this is the showdown. This, this is, is the showdown. The, yep. Uh, this is it. Crescendo, the moment we've all been waiting uh, This for. is it right here. All right, let's talk about Spartan Forge. You can find them at S-P-A-R-T-A-N-F-O-R-G-E dot A-I. Go check them out. They have an amazing app. Spartan Forge is an all-encompassing hunting and planning application powered by artificial intelligence. Developed by a U.S. Army Warrant Officer conducting intelligence preparation of the battlefield in the special missions arena for our nation's most elite operators. The app offers military-based targeting, for hunters. The technology uses artificial intelligence powered movement prediction. It features movement prediction paired with current and historical wind data, current forecasts, and state data. They partnered with premier universities to collect data on deer movement. It is as accurate and testable as scientifically possible. No snake oil, no bullshit. Its UAV map features next level imagery detail, the highest resolution offered on the market with up to seven years of historical imagery. Its Blue Force tracker allows users to share pins and location data to a set group of peers in a user-defined area. The LiDAR map lets hunters look through the trees and structures to see topography like never before, giving the user a detailed viewpoint of trails, beds, and more. And the Lambda map is fully customizable, set to parameters selected by the user for fast access. It will also indicate public and private land boundaries. The journal feature lets users keep track of every detail of their hunt, write historical descriptions, and add photos and waypoints, all while pulling historical weather pattern data. And its desktop app features Eastman's Tag Hub. Spartan Forge works hand-in-hand with Eastman's to integrate Tag Hub app into Spartan Forge, providing Western hunting draw odds and stats. Users can search by location, species, season, and and trophy potential to best plan their Western hunt. Get 30% off if you sign up with the code DANGERCLOSE at www.spartanforge.ai. That is S-P-A-R-T-A-N-F-O-R-G-E dot A-I. That is the highest discount they have ever offered, and it is perfect to get started on that summer scouting. Check them out, spartanforge.ai. And uh, this one right here, yep, this is Nazar the Assassin, part four. And this is where I was thinking long and hard about how to write a sniper-centric novel that doesn't end up with two snipers on opposite hillsides or opposite buildings searching for each other through their scopes. And at the last second, they find each other at the same time and they both fire or one fires first and it goes through the scope of the other guy and kills him. Um, Because that's been written about quite a few times and a lot of movies and TV shows and things like that. So I needed to figure out how you write a sniper centric novel without that kind of a penultimate scene. And I thought, what if, uh, in this case you have two snipers and, uh, mate, it might not necessarily be the sniper with the highest level of skill who wins in this engagement. Maybe one can outthink the other, but not outthink the other uh, in terms of just being across from one another, searching, be playing that three-dimensional chess, thinking a few steps ahead. And then when the reader gets to this point where I reveal that, then have another element that comes in at the end with the bookseller who, uh, who was in there at the end. And I don't even want to talk too much about that because I want people to read it. Um, and, uh, and so that's pretty much how this one finishes up this story, this individual story. Um, 
and Reese comes home. Well, there's, they kill somebody else in, in Moscow. So that they do that too with the bookseller. Now they've come together. Now they're a team. They go do that. Um, which is pretty cool. I like that. And then come back to Montana. And, uh, we think that, uh, I wanted to set it up so that people who have read a lot of these books would think that Katie's, and this is a spoiler alert, please. Spoiler alert. The whole thing's a spoiler alert. But, yeah, but Jack, I was good. What you're about to say is so true. Cause I, as did I'm you reading think? the end of this book, I am, I, I see, oh, I see where this is going. I've seen this before. Exactly. So that's what I wanted to do for people who have read all these political thrillers. Um, I wanted them to think, He's going down this path because that's typically what an author would do at this stage of a series. And uh, so I was setting it up uh, for those people in particular to think exactly what you thought. That uh, There he goes. Yep, I know exactly what's going to happen. Katie's going to take this sniper bullet. There's snipers on the, on the hillside up here. And yeah, she's a goner. It's about time for her to go uh, as far as these kind of stories go. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, I guess that's okay. You know, that's what I wanted them to think. And uh, so I have re- Reese and Katie and Reese has an engagement ring in his pocket and uh, they're talking about the future and what Reese wants to do and him starting a, a bookstore in Montana that's also archery and a whiskey bar and a coffee house, all those things that uh, he and I love. Uh, and so they're excited about the future and then a phone rings, but there's no cell service or Wi-Fi here. And uh, that's from Alice. That is from the quantum computer, from artificial intelligence. Um, and they answer that phone. And she says, turn on, turn on the TV, turn on the radio. Um, and sure enough, the president has been assassinated. And for those that think that was a cliffhanger, people talk about it being a cliffhanger. Uh, I, I set that up all the way back with the devil's hand. So for people that were paying attention in the devil's hand, there are things in there that uh, if you're paying attention would lead to this exact moment. And same thing with the last book in the blood, things there that would lead to this exact moment. So this is the most cliffhanger esque of the novels. Um, even though there are storylines that continue, this one is the one that you could call a cliffhanger. Um, but it's not a cliffhanger in the sense that I got to a hundred thousand words and then was like, Oh, time to wrap this up. I'm going to stop. And then I'm gonna start the next book. Uh, cause that's the schedule I'm on and I have a deadline looming. Uh, so that's not it at all. Um, uh, this is all about the story and I have no problem moving deadlines because this is all about the story. It's all about that reader who's trusting me with their time. They're never going to get back and it has to be the best story it can possibly be. Um, but this one is one that you could call a cliffhanger uh, more so than the others. But President Christensen is assassinated. FBI Joint Task Force descends on Reese and Katie in the mountains of Montana and off Reese goes handcuffed uh, into the next novel. So that's how this one finishes up. Well, I can attest and uh, uh, say that you are not lying. If you need to uh, extend a deadline, if you're not ready <laughs> to turn something in, uh, you have no problem saying I'm not ready. It's not perfect. I don't want my readers to read it yet. I can attest to that because there are a lot of people in the office with a lot more gray hair than they used to have before you came to us. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> so you, you will... <laughs> So there will never be a Jack Carr book that he doesn't want out there or he didn't have enough time to finish because he's going to take all the time he needs and more. <laughs> no, that's what I figure that I owe. Um, we, I, we I owe this audience. The, this series of podcasts by Jack saying he didn't know the rules of writing novels <laughs> or the unwritten rules. Well, he still doesn't. Uh, deadlines <laughs> don't mean anything to him. <laughs> I'm st I've never been much of a rule a follower. Um, and that's why it, seems, it might seem strange that the military was a drug but special operations, you need to be really a creative, aggressive problem solver, which is uh, why a lot of special operators do get in trouble when there's not a war and sometimes even when there is a war. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, those, uh, I've never been much big fan of the rules. I think that goes back to Robert Conrad playing Pappy Boynton in Black Sheep Squadron back in the day, a TV show. I think I learned a lot of my, my leadership and life lessons by watching that show with my dad back in the early eighties when it was in syndication. But, uh, this one right here, I'd once again, every book I finish is my favorite. And then I start the next one and then I finish that. And that is my favorite. I don't know if it'll always be that way, but that's how it's been thus far. And, uh, and in the blood, I think in the blood and savage son, if I had to do an informal poll, those would be people's quote unquote favorites. Um, everybody has a different, you know, different favorite, but if I was to put people in, if I was to add them all up informally and just put them in stacks, I think the highest stacks would be savage son and in the blood thus far. Um, and I hope that changes 
with Only the Dead here coming out May 16th. And if those first two reviews are any indication, um, man, those first two reviews uh, were pretty solid. And from the real books by, and then from John Nance at town hall. So people can go look, look those up or go to my, my blog section of my website. They're both in the blog section of the website. Um, cause you never know you finish something like this and it's like, you've worked on a statue or a painting for as long as it took. And then it's covered with a sheet or something. And then you bring everybody in and they're all looking at it. And then you pull the sheet away and you might have just gasps of horror. You never know. <laughs> so, uh, so getting those first reviews in and having them be so amazing. Uh, I mean, it's a sigh. It's, it, I, I, I have a sigh of relief, I guess, when I see the first ones, it's like, okay, um, that's so that. That, that, and those were so well written. They, yeah, really to, pull, to pull back the curtain on what happens when a review comes in from my point of view is that when I get a review, I send it around internally to the publisher, to Emily, the, 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 who is your publisher, uh, Libby, who is the publisher of all of Atria, uh, and to other people uh, within the organization. And in the subject line, I editorialize the review. I say solid review about Only the Dead from Real, this uh, okay review. When I sent around the town hall review, I said bonkers review. Nice. Because I had never read a review that well written, first of all, but so effusive. Of, I mean, and it's all true because it is hard not to really uh, be. And I'm not saying I'm saying this as a fan. I know I'm a publicist, so I, you would expect or others would expect me to talk like this. But you're not lying this time. I'm not lying and I'm not doing this uh, podcast series with you really as a publicist. I'm doing it as a fan. And uh, everything is true. Uh, where we were talking about how uh, you want to do something different in the end of this one that people weren't expecting, as we all know, uh, the love interest of a hero in these books is, has very bad job security. <laughs> so we were all, and as I was too, but I, I have to stop thinking like that because like I said from the beginning, this guy is different. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That means so much to me. So much, it really does. And, uh, man, it's all, it's all about that story. And I feel so fortunate that I wanted to do this for so long and that I had all those authors that I grew up with essentially teaching me and giving me this foundation from which to build. So, um, I couldn't think of a better way to have laid that foundation than from being a fan and being a reader and watching films, watching movies, noticing the adaptation from these books to film and to, to, uh, television, and then, uh, studying warfare my whole life as well. And studying that's uh, counterinsurgencies and insurgencies and uh, terrorism and special operations warfare in general, and then applying that on the field of battle in Iraq and Afghanistan in a practical way. And then moving in to my next chapter in life as an author. So uh, I feel extremely fortunate that my mom uh, was a librarian, still is a librarian, and that uh, both my parents raised me with reading as a natural part of my life. It wasn't something that was forced upon me. It was just a natural part of life. You read. And uh, I think that has made all the difference. I think we all feel fortunate that they did that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And that is in the blood. And, uh, do you have any other questions about that that you've always wanted to ask that you can ask right now? Well, I am intrigued. Well, first of all, you glossed, when you're going through the recap, you, you, you glossed over the torture. You said there was torture, but let's focus a little bit on the torture du jour. Yeah. So a little torture in, uh, in Italy. So once again, this is facilitated, um, through Abelard and they have to take a journey together, a car journey with, uh, somebody locked in the trunk who, uh, is a pretty tough character. And, uh, I love developing these characters that, and, and, and I, I would never compare myself you know, to, to anyone, but I've heard reviewers, this is, this is a better, yeah. I've heard reviewers talk about Vince Flynn and say that he would develop these amazing characters and then they're dead. Like, <laughs> and, uh, so maybe I got this, that sort of a thing from, uh, you know, from, from him, I don't know, but, uh, but, uh, I, but I love doing that. I love going, I don't just like having a Russian who served in Afghanistan somewhere between 1979 and 1989. Okay. No, it can't. I can't just have that. I need to know more about him. I need to know like what drew him in to the Soviet military. Was he conscripted? Did he go in? What was his background? What was his dad's background? Um, what, uh, what was he going to do afterward? Was it a lifelong thing? What happened to him there that led him to be in this certain situation, this, in this case, in the trunk of this car headed to this doctor who Abelard has used in the past, who also has a background specifically 
in torture with its roots in reality, I should say. Um, oh. And that's all from research. Once again, this is all from research, not from anything I experienced in the military, but from research and from interviews. So, uh, so yeah, it goes to a, a medical facility and, uh, and gets some information extracted for both Reese and then at the end for Abelard, because Abelard has been looking for the person who put him in that wheelchair um, since it happened. And uh, anyway... I, uh, yeah, I love doing all that stuff. So I love giving characters that someone would call a smaller character, a supporting character, you know, that sort of a thing. Backgrounds that bring that person to life. That's not a carbon copy of anything that I've ever seen anywhere else. So or read anywhere else. So, um, so that's in there too. And we glossed over a lot of the Israeli section as well. Uh, bad guys coming in, how they're getting in to, to Israel. And uh, once again, in the back of this book, there's another author's note. And that talks about what was fact and what was fiction uh, about what people have just read. So if they have questions at the end, the author's note is there to provide a few of those answers. And we didn't talk enough about Alice and AI, but but we don't have to because people should read it. Read it because now there's uh, Chat GPT because now it's in the news every day. I say, so. I mean, first of all, you were way ahead of it. Now it's all the rage, and that's all anybody was talking about. But you were on this last year. But also, what's in this book is mind-boggling. But you had I heard you say in interviews that if you put everything that you learned in this book. They would have had to have shelved this book in science fiction. That's right. So uh, many of the people that I talked to doing the research for this book, just like an investigative journalist would, um, made the point. That's why it stands out, because more than one said this. Uh, multiple people said this. They said, if I told you any more, your book would go in the science fiction category. And uh, so that tells me that what I describe in here, and this is last year, so which means I did the research <laughs> at least a week ahead of time. No, a few <laughs> months ahead of time. Um, so the research was there six months, eight months ahead of time um, for that particular part. And uh, so imagine how much further along, if this isn't quite exactly where we were back then as far as capability with AI and quantum computing, and people were telling me back then that work in the space, that if they told me any more, it would end up in the science fiction category. Imagine a year, a year and a half from those interviews, what we are like today with the, with if we have ChatGPT on our side, well, military and intelligence service certainly has a few levels above. And uh, that part is a little bit chilling. Yes, uh, I am chilled to the core thinking about it. Uh, but I will uh, warm myself up with thoughts of reading only the dead when it comes out. That's right. That's right. And uh, for people that are looking at this right now that are watching, this is hardcover in the blood. And this is paperback. I love the paperback covers because they are so different than the hardcover and the trade paperback, the larger one, isn't out yet, but it'll be out here in a few months. And then, of course, the audio is still available in CD for people that aren't getting it from Audible or, or Apple books uh, on the audio side of the house, read by Ray Porter, who always just knocks it out of the house. And in the earlier one, in uh, when we went through the terminal list, uh, I was holding up the different versions, and there are a bunch of international editions as well. But this has got to be my favorite international edition because this is the Japanese edition right here. So this is uh, a very cool graphic cover right there. And uh, obviously it goes the other direction than we're used to here in the United States. But I just thought this was a really cool, unique cover, very different from any of the other ones uh, out there. And so that is the terminal list in Japanese. Very cool. Very cool. And what else do we have for in the blood? Anything else? I think we did it. Nice. Nice. All right. That is the recap of in the blood. Uh, by the time people listen to this, we'll probably already be on book tour. We're starting that this weekend, Sunday, the 14th of May, which is mother's day and kicking it off at Poison Pen in Scottsdale, Arizona. Then off we go to Austin on Monday and then continue on for the rest of the week and the week after that or half of the week after that. So if anybody's listening to this in time, you can go to the website, go to officialjackcar.com, click on that book tour section and find a bookstore near you. But if you don't make it and you'd still like a signed copy, many of the bookstores would be more than happy to put aside a signed copy for you and send it to you. So you can still give that business to small independent bookstores out there uh, if you so desire. And looking forward to seeing everybody on the road. 
to include you, David, because you're coming with me. Can't wait. Awesome. Can't wait. Awesome. I'll be there. I'm All the right. muscle. <laughs> That's right. That's right. My bodyguard. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. Amazing. Always great to see you. And I'll see you in a few days here as we kick off book tour. And uh, to everybody else, thank you for joining us on this. Hope that gave a cool little behind the scenes along with a recap of the novels leading up to Only the Dead on Shelves, May 16th, ebook, hardcover, and audio. Thanks so much.